morning, church. I want to share a scripture with you. Matthew chapter 28, verse 19 and 20. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Let's pray together. Father, as we open your word, may we never take lightly the reading of your scriptures. They were written down for our benefit, for our instruction, so that we would know the way that we are to walk. We would know what we are to do and what we are to refrain from doing. However, you have given us the choice whether we Submit to do what is in front of us to do as instructed by you or to deny and to walk our own way. We make a choice before we read any farther that we will submit to your word. We will do as it says, not because we agree with it, but because you have said it and you are holy you are the author, not just of the text, but the author of all things. You are all wise and all knowing. You are our Lord and our God. So we submit to that authority and we find incredible peace and comfort knowing that we serve a God who is all powerful. A God that has created everything that we can see. He has created what we cannot see. And all that is good comes from this God. So how peaceful to trust you. How calming to know that what we are about to read in your scripture is true and accurate. And we don't need to worry about Debate if our opinion lines up with your word, we simply submit to your word because we know the author is true and just and right. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't use our intellect that you have given us. It means that we find truth and we find perfect knowledge in the pages of Scripture. It is a trustworthy timeless text breathed out by the Holy Spirit written for our edification our instruction so God we all commit to pay attention as we read your word to give you our full attention and all the mental energy that we can to really look at the text to not be distracted to consider this a holy moment where you, God, speak to us and you grant us wisdom to discern your word rightly. Guide us, we ask, through this time. Our hearts are willing, our minds are attentive, our spirit is hungry. We are eager now. We ask all of this in the name of Jesus, our Messiah. And wherever you are, you can agree by saying, Amen and Amen. Well, it is always my honor to open the Word of God with you. Today, we're going to, to look at the topic of water baptism. What is it? Why do we do it? How should we do it? 
Is this something that God ordained for us to do? Is it something that we have created over time? Is there a proper procedure or is it open for interpretation? Are there directions? When should we get baptized? Should children be baptized? Should infants be baptized? All of these legitimate questions, all of which have their answers in Holy Scripture. The first thing we must answer is that it is not open to man's opinion. It is to be found in Holy Scripture. This is where we find divine truth. So we're going to go to the text to see what the text says on how we are to operate and what is the purpose of water baptism. Let's go to Matthew 28, verse 19 and 20 that we've already read. Matthew 28, 19 and 20. This is Jesus speaking and he begins in the beginning of 19 by saying, Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. And then he says, baptizing them. And then he gives instruction in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So let's make sure we understand the order in which this was laid out. Go, therefore, and make disciples. That's step one. Then step two, baptize them. Step three, the, the protocol and how we go about doing that in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And then there's what we do after the baptism. There's more instruction, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. So we're going to take a look through those instructions. How do we make disciples and what does that mean? What does baptizing actually mean? What does it mean in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? And then how do we actually teach and observe what God has commanded us? Let's take a look at those and see how God laid out for us to operate holy water baptism. It begins with, go therefore and make disciples of all nations. This is prior to the water. Let's make note of that. Prior to the water, there must be a decision made. Water baptism is not for the unrepented and the non-Christian. So let's make sure we understand holy water baptism is not for the unsaved, the, those that do not follow Jesus Christ. It is also not the means of salvation, meaning the, the way that you get saved is by being water baptized. No, it first says to make disciples. Then it says to baptize those disciples. So first we must believe. That's what scripture tells us. First we must believe. Romans chapter 10 verse 9, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. Step one to holy baptism is to believe in Jesus Christ as the Son of God, crucified on your behalf as a payment for sin, recognizing that you are a sinner. This is the beginning, the pre-water portion of baptism. You must believe in Jesus Christ. Now, it's not your interpretation of Jesus, it is the biblical interpretation of Jesus. You must confess with your mouth that Jesus was not just a good man or a good teacher, but he is Lord. He is God. Meaning you have submitted your life to him. If he is your Lord, means he, he lords, he, is, he has authority. You have submitted 
under the authority of Jesus Christ. That's where we begin, before the water. First, we must believe. Secondly, we must repent. First, you believe, not just that there is a God. That's very important that we understand that if you believe that there is a God, but you're not really sure who that God is or, or the attributes of said God, if you just think that there's an ethereal being out there that is full of love and kindness, that is not at all believing in Jesus Christ, according to the scriptures. Because even the devil believes in God. It is the submission under the headship of that God, meaning he's the Lord of your life. He is God and you are his creation. You have been purchased by God through the blood of his son. His son, Jesus, came to earth to rescue us from our own sin that we were perpetually living in. We could not pay for sin, for the wages of sin is death. We could not continue to pay for our actions, our words, and our thoughts. So a payment was made on our behalf, that is, the sacrifice of Jesus, the Son of God. He willingly gave his life, and that paid for sin once and for all. So we have been redeemed saved. However, that is, the, that is what he did. We must receive that gift of being saved, the receiving of redemption, and then we must repent. What does repent mean? Repent means it is a turning away from our wicked ways. Sin is doing the opposite of what God wants us to do. God has told us what we are to do. Sin is to do the opposite of that. So to repent is to simply say, forgive me, and then literally to turn and to walk in the will of God. To repent is not simply to say, I'm sorry, knowing very well you plan to do this uh, wicked thing again, to purposefully uh, walk in the direction you know you're not supposed to walk, but just kind of washing off the whiteboard by saying, I'm sorry, is not actual repentance. The, the Hebrew and Greek word for repentance both mean to turn, meaning we have to turn around and go the right direction. So we must repent. This is where John the Baptist came in. In Acts chapter 2, verse 38, it says that Peter said to them that they should repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins. That's what Peter said right after Jesus went into heaven. And then it tells us in 1 John 1, 8 and 9, if we say we have no sin, maybe we think that, I have nothing to repent of, I've done nothing wrong. Well, Scripture says, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. However, if we confess our sins, he, that is God, is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This is what John the Baptist was doing. It was for the repentance of sins. So water baptism, before we get to the water, we must believe in Jesus Christ. We must turn from our wicked ways. We must repent. God, forgive me, for I was going in the wrong direction and I now desire to go in the right direction. Would you forgive me? We must repent. Notice Peter said, repent and then be baptized. That's very important that first we repent and then we are baptized. Every one of you must do this. Do you see that Peter says, Acts 2, 38, every one of you, no one is outside the realm 
of needing to be baptized. Next, we must commit to God. It's one thing to believe in God. It's something else to repent for what we've done wrong. But now we must commit to follow God. This is the other piece that is prior to water baptism. We commit to follow God. It is not that we are water baptized and then we go back to live the life that we were living before, thinking the way that we were living before, where God is is only a priority when we need him. No, we actually must commit to follow God as our main priority in life prior to water baptism. Let me show you what it looks like to commit to following God. Psalm 37 verse five says to commit your way to the Lord and to trust him. Proverbs 16 verse three says, commit your work to the Lord and your plans will be established. Committing our way, the way we do our life, we give it to God. Even what we do for work, we give it to God. Everything that we do, how we raise our children, how we relate with our friends, how we operate in a community, we commit this to God. We are following God. This is a decision made prior to water baptism. In Deuteronomy chapter 6 is a confession of faith that the Israelites would say every single day. And it helps you and I understand the priority of our confession. We're going to put God first. I want to show you what they used to say every day. It's in Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 5. It says that you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart with all your soul, and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, And they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. In other words, it consumes our life to be those that follow God. And we make that commitment. God, I give you everything that I am. The way I do life, I give it to you. Is it pleasing to you? You are my Lord and my God. I submit to your authority. This decision of believing in God, repenting before God, and committing our life to God is all prior to the water. This brings up a valid question. If all of this needs to take place prior to water baptism, can an infant be baptized in water. So let's go over the list. Can an infant fully understand and believe in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior? Can an infant repent from what they have thought? Can an infant commit his life over to God? The obvious answer is they don't understand any of this yet. The only reason that infants have ever been baptized was when there was a belief that if they were not water baptized, that if they were to die, they would not dwell in heavenly places because they were not baptized. And that is not true. That is nowhere in Scripture. By the way, nowhere in Scripture, in all 66 books of the canon of Scripture, is it ever told to us that infants should be water baptized. No sign of that, no command of that, no even inkling that leads us to think that. The reason why we began to baptize infants over the years was that fright that we had that they would not dwell in heaven if they were to perish before they could make these confessions. 
And that's a misunderstanding of something that's called the grace of innocence. Now, we don't have time to get into all of the idea of grace of innocence, but what it simply means is if someone is not able to comprehend the things of God, meaning to be able to believe in Jesus Christ and to have the uh, cognitive ability to repent and to be able to commit oneself to following the Lord Jesus Christ. If you're not able to comprehend those concepts, then you are under the shadow and the wings of grace. God is a good and just judge. He is kind-hearted and tender and loving. Don't you understand the concept that when an infant who has innocence, if it perishes on earth, goes directly into the hands of its creator? The same goes for those who are never in their lifetime able to make these kind of decisions because they do not have the cognitive ability to do so. They have grace in their innocence. Now, you and I might not have that innocence. We know the good we ought to do, and we choose not to do it. For us, that grace of innocence does not exist. We know what we should do. We've just chosen not to do it because it's difficult or hard or uncomfortable. Now, there is grace in innocence when we do something that we should not do, but we did not know that we should not do it. However, that's why as we learn in the church what we should do, what we should refrain from doing, then we'll be held accountable for knowing this is the way we should walk and we should stay away from this. Then we are held accountable. So should infants be baptized according to Holy Scripture? No. However, they should be blessed. That's what Jesus did. When the infants and the young were brought to him, he did not baptize them, he blessed them. He prayed protection over them. That's what we should do as a church. When God gives us the uh, brand new gift in, in the innocence of a child, that child is brought before the church and a prayer of blessing over that child is given a protection. And when that child is able to understand and make these decisions for themselves and the parents agree and the church agrees, then we celebrate with water baptism. What age does that happen at is unique for each individual person. Some, it might be younger when they're able to comprehend who Jesus is and what he's done for them. Some, it might be older when they're fully able to make that decision that I have decided on my own accord to follow God. So, no, infants should not be water baptized. However, they should be blessed and cared for by the church and by the family. Let's go back to Matthew 28. Let's look at the next section of that verse 19. Now we understand, go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Now let's get to baptizing them. That's the next section of verse 19, baptizing them. The physical act of submersion. How do we know if it should be something uh, dripped on our head uh, water poured over our head, just on our hands? Should we go completely under the water? What are the, what's the protocol? How do we know? Because we know that we've seen all sorts of different practices in different churches. This is where we can't rely on our tradition. We must go to the scriptures only. Our traditions uh, can fade into a, a, a false direction. It's not necessarily on purpose, but we can go from believing one thing into someone else's interpretation of that thing, and it can lead us down a road where we get unbiblical. What does Scripture say about water baptism? Let's go to the word, baptize. Matthew 28, 19, go therefore make disciples of all nations. And then you see this word, baptizo. That's the Greek, baptizo, B-A-P, 
T-I-Z-O, baptizo. What does baptizo mean in the Greek? Every time in the New Testament we see the word baptizo, it means the same thing. To submerge, to fully immerse. It is the same word every time. To completely submerge. There actually is a definition in the original Greek dictionary that talked about how you dye wool. And the only way to dye the wool is to fully put it submerged, baptizo, into the dye. If any part of the wool is left out of the dye, it has not fully been baptizo, baptized, because that part of the wool did not get the dye into it. So you have to fully immerse, fully submerge. So there, that's the scriptures. It, it helps us because it undoes tradition when we simply go back to what the text says. This is what the text says. We are to, if we were to read this in the Greek, it would say, go therefore make disciples of all nations, uh, fully submerge them. That's how it would have read. There, has, there was no question to all the disciples for hundreds of years what it meant to baptizo, to submerge the people in water. Now, where did this idea of baptizing people actually come from? And I think this is important for us to have just a brief history so we know how this idea of submersion in water came to be. It began with a priestly ordination. The original priests were baptized or baptizo. They, it was an ordination of their confession to become priests. So when a priest uh, came of age, which was 30 years old, they were baptized. They were fully submerged under water, then they were brought up, dried off, and then anointed with oil on their forehead. This teaches us, now that you and I are priests before God, that's how he set it up, it's not just pastors, it is all of us, we are the priests of God. We are his children part of his royal family. He's adopted us in. He is our king, but he called us priests. So we are submerged under water, and then when we come up, then, we, then there's this anointing that simplifies the Holy Spirit, and that is something different. The priests were submerged. It was part of their confession. I confess my life before God, and they were baptized. However, this changed for quite some time for those that were not in the priesthood, those who were not part of the Levitical family. Uh, they had what they called a baptismal, but it was a ritual ceremonial cleaning. It was not a confession of their faith. It was a, a ritual cleaning. What this looked like was these small uh, like pools that they had before they got into the temple. And some of those pools are still there in, in the uh, ancient city. This is where they would go and they would simply dip their hands and they would shake them off. And there was a ritual on how you did this. Uh, some people were, they would uh, wash their hands a certain way. And this was a, a ritual cleaning to get off any sort of uh, filth. They believed that there were small little demons on all sorts of different things, and this was a ceremonial washing. This is actually what's referred to when Jesus went to someone's house, and it said that the Pharisees were upset with him because he didn't wash his hands before he ate. It had nothing to do with that he didn't cleanse his hands uh, from coming from outside to inside to eat dinner. He did cleanse his hands. It, they were referring to this ritual of this certain uh, cleansing that they would do to, to get any sort of demonic filth off of them before they went into the temple. This is nothing that we have ever been instructed to do. This was made by the Sanhedrin and it was not necessary, nowhere is it commanded to have this ritual sort of cleaning ceremony. That's something that man made. 
Then John the Baptist comes in, and John the Baptist begins a different baptism. It's a lot more like what the priestly baptism was, except the difference was it was called a proselyte baptism. The proselyte baptism was a baptism of repentance, the forgiveness of sins. And so people would come to John, the baptizer, and they would confess their sins. He would completely submerge them under the water, and when they came up, there was this freedom from the guilt and the shame, and there was this freedom, and he would begin to tell them, the Messiah is coming. He would say, prepare the way for the Lord. The the messianic Messiah is on his way. I've been sent here to tell you, prepare your heart. And the next person would come. He'd say, prepare your heart. And they would submerge under the water. And when they stood up, they were cleansed from unrighteousness, prepared. And that's why the day Jesus showed up to see John the Baptist, Instead of John the Baptist saying, come forward and be submerged for the repentance of your sin, John the Baptist actually said, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Here he is. This is the one I've been telling you about. He's arrived. Now, we see this throughout Scripture. Luke chapter 3, verse 3 says that John went into all the regions around the Jordan proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Even Paul mentions John in Acts 19, verse 4, saying that John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in the one who was to come after him, that is, Jesus. Now, what actually happens when we submerge in water? It's not just a ritual. It is not just a picture of something. God has commanded us to do two things until he comes that are part of the church, other than the the teaching of the word, other than the reading of Holy Scripture and making sure that his house remains a house of prayer, there are two uh, pieces that he gave us that we are to continue. Number one is Holy Communion. He said, I want you to continue to do this until I come. And the second is Holy Water Baptism. I want you to be baptizing those who come to know who I am. Once they are raised up, then they should be baptized. So what actually happens when the baptism happens? There are two things that actually happen. Number one is is not necessarily what we think. Some people call it bath and burial. Bath meaning it is a cleansing. When you go under the water, there is a cleansing. It is a washing away of the filth that we have created, the filth of the world. Now we use water for life, but we use water for cleansing. That's the the majority of what you and I use water for is cleansing from Uh, our dishes to our clothing and almost everything we have, we need water for cleansing. So there is a cleansing, but did you know that there's actually a cleansing of your conscience in water baptism? I'm gonna show you where it is. We normally miss this in water baptism. It's in 1 Peter chapter three, verse 21. It says this, baptism which corresponds to this now saves you not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience. It's not just the physical cleansing that you and I would do every day. This is a cleansing of the conscience. Those things that we have done are washed away. 
When the water completely comes over us and washes over us, it is a cleansing of all that filth and we are released from it. But the second thing that happens is it's a burial. This is another reason not only does the word baptismo mean to fully submerge, but we are attending a burial when we go and see someone water baptized. We are burying the old persons completely submerged under the water. They are buried. However, when they come out of the water, they come out freshly resurrected and reborn as a new creation, a new person, a fresh start, a child of God. The old is gone and the new has come. I'm going to show you in scripture where we see this. It begins by saying, what shall we say then? Romans chapter 6 verse 1. Are we to continue to sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were baptized buried therefore with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. A whole new life, a burial, a cleansing, a resurrection. So there is a holy act. There is something that actually happens. It's not just a mere picture of, it is the act of going under the water and the burial and the death and the resurrection of a new life. But this is not where the scripture ends. If you go back to the original scripture in Matthew 28, notice that it says how we are to baptize. It says in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. These are very clear instructions. This is called the Trinitarian Confession because we we are the only ones to baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. This is not how John the Baptist baptized, that proselyte baptism was only repentance. What we are doing is not a proselyte baptism. We baptize in the name of the Father, a crucified Son, and a Spirit that dwells among us today. See, it's not just for repentance. It's a completely new life now. And only through the blood of Christ in his death and resurrection could this new baptism be available. That's what you and I have today. This is why you are baptized in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, Jesus Christ, and the name of the Holy Spirit, a triune God. God the Father is God, Jesus is God, the Holy Spirit is God. Separately they are God, together they are God. They are three in one. The best picture that we ever have in all of scripture of the Trinitarian God is actually at Jesus' baptism. I'll show it to you. Jesus, remember when John told him, uh, here comes the Lamb of God to take away the sins of the world. When Jesus came up out of the water, let me explain and let me show you what actually happened. Matthew chapter 3 verse 16 says, when Jesus was baptized, immediately when he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming 
to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. We see all three members of the Trinity in one place, at one time. I'll show you. Jesus is the one being baptized. The voice is the Father, and the dove represents the Holy Spirit. Let's look at it again. When he came up out of the water, that's Jesus, the heavens were opened to him. He saw the Spirit of God descend like a dove coming to rest, and the voice from heaven said, this is my Son. All three members of the Godhead present at one time. So you and I are baptized by the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit for new life. That's why that is the Trinitarian confession. However, what happens after the water? If this is what happens, there's work to be done before the baptism. There's a holy moment of what actually happens during the practice of the baptism. Is there anything that needs to be done afterwards? Meaning you come up out of the water, you walk out of the water, now what? Is there anything else that needs to be done? Or can we go back to what we were doing? The, the, the ritual is over. Actually, let's go back to Matthew 28 and look at verse 20. It says, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. That's the next thing. Right after it says to baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then he says, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. If you go to the end of uh, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, do you notice that that's a comma? It's not even a period. It, it continues the sentence in verse 20 teaching them to observe what I've commanded you. It's the next thing that happens. When we come out, what we call post-water action, when we come out of the water, there is a new life in front of you. The best example that I can come up with to help you understand that there is action to be taken after the baptism is to give you the picture of a marriage. See, there is love before the marriage. They love each other. They're in love with each other. They have fallen in love with each other. They have confessed that love for each other. They have expressed that they want to spend the rest of their lives together. Marriage is inevitable. They decide to get married. They come together before the church and before God and they make that vow of commitment. Till death do us part. I will love and cherish you. I will take care of you. In sickness and in health, no matter what comes, we will do this together. We are now one flesh. The marriage ceremony commences, the music plays, the celebration begins. Now what? Now what happens? Now the marriage begins. Now you begin life together. It begins with a honeymoon. Honeymoons don't last forever. Life happens, but we're still married. And we work on that marriage. Good marriages take effort communication, being able to work with each other and understand each other and listen to each other, submit to each other, be vulnerable with each other. The marriage as a whole is far more than the ceremony of commitment. So is post-water actions. Now we go. Now we live our life before God. It says teaching, teaching them. See, in Acts chapter 2, verse 41, it says, those who received his words were baptized and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. Acts 2, 41 and 42. 
After they were baptized, they went and began to learn how to live out this Christian life. What is what follows being baptized? A life pursuit of learning about Jesus Christ. And then the next thing it says is to observe all that I've commanded you. Observing. Actually doing it. We're supposed to observe the law. We're supposed to follow it. See, James chapter 1 verse 22 says to be doers of the word, not hearers only, or we're deceiving ourselves. Once the baptism happens, you don't need to do it again and again and again. Just like think of the marriage. If the marriage ceremony happens, the confession of faith happens, the confession of love happens, the confession is written on a piece of paper that says you are now husband and wife, you are one flesh before God. But as you live out your married life, and you learn more about marriage, you don't get remarried. You just learn more about what you did and what it means to be a good, loving husband, what it means to be a good, loving wife. We don't have to keep getting married over and over as we learn new things about each other. We get remarried to each other. That's the same with water baptism. You might have learned a lot more about water baptism by hearing these words. It doesn't mean you need to go get re-baptized. You need to be baptized. But you don't need to constantly have this uh, over and over mentality of being baptized over and over and over again. You learn more about what you did the day that you were baptized. But also with the idea of observing, Deuteronomy chapter 5 verse 32 says that you shall be careful therefore to do as the Lord your God has commanded you. You shall not turn aside to the right hand or to the left. In other words, we have to actually do what's commanded of us to do. This new life, this fresh start, you will not live it perfectly, no one does. But you are constantly learning. You, you sit under good teachers that teach you the word of God. And then you observe the law of God. You do what he said to do. You're careful to do what God told you to do. But then it ends with this. Behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Jesus set the example for us of both water baptism and how we are to live out our life. Did you know that Jesus is technically the only man that's ever walked the planet who didn't need to be baptized? He's the only one that didn't need to be baptized. He was perfect. He didn't need any uh, cleansing of his conscience. He didn't need to die and then and then be reborn. He didn't need to repent of anything. He was perfect, and he would actually die the physical death for us, but he didn't need to die of his old self. His old self was perfect. However, even the man who didn't need to be baptized was baptized to show us that we should be baptized. Did you know that John the Baptist had a little disagreement with Jesus on the day he was baptized? Now, I don't know if you would have a disagreement or an argument with Jesus if he told you what to do, but John did. And this is what actually happened. See, in Matthew chapter 3, verse 13, it says, Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to John to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? That is, seems legitimate. You're perfect. There's no reason for you to be baptized. I, John the Baptist, I am not perfect. I should be the one being baptized by you, the perfect one, the Messiah. But look at how Jesus responds. He says in verse 15 of Matthew 3, Jesus answered, Let it be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill 
all righteousness. And then it says that John consented and, and baptized Jesus. I want people who look back on me to see what I did. I'm setting the example for what they should do. So the, the question would be, should you be baptized if you have not been baptized? Is, is there anyone out there that doesn't need to be baptized that maybe is living a good enough life, that hasn't done anything really extremely wrong, doesn't really need to be baptized? Well, let's see, if we do the logical math, there's only one man who didn't need to be baptized, and he was to tell you that you should. So, not my opinion, but according to Holy Scripture, Everyone should be baptized. Two questions we want to answer before we close. Number one, what happens if you get saved, but you're not able to get water baptized? Maybe you're saved as a person, an elderly person, and you're not able to be baptized before you go to be with the Lord. Are you still going to be with the Lord if you are not water baptized? Absolutely yes. Because it said already, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. However, if you are able, you should be water baptized and that is as clear as crystal all through the scriptures. It is not an excuse for you who are able to be baptized. God says you are to be baptized. Two rites given uh, in the church. Holy communion, that is for the, the Christians, the children of God. Holy communion is not for the unbeliever. It is only for the believer. And the other rite given to the church is holy water baptism. Again, not for the non-Christian, but for the person that calls him God, Lord and Savior. So, if you cannot be, if someone you know was not, are they still saved? Well, one, that is between them and God. It is not my call. But what I can tell you that Scripture says is if you believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord and there has been a remission of your sins, you stand right before God, not because of your good works, but because of the payment for your sins on the cross through Jesus Christ. But let's ask one more question. When should I be baptized? Like, how much do I need to know about God before I'm baptized? Should I, should I attend a bunch of Bible classes? Should I have lived several years in the church and really have a good biblical discerning understanding of what water baptism is, how long should I wait to be water baptized? We're going to look at one last story with the answer. Acts chapter 8, verse 26. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Rise and go towards the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert place. And he rose and he went and there was an Ethiopian, a eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasure. He had just come to Jerusalem to worship. And was returning, seated in his chariot, and he was reading the prophet Isaiah. And the spirit said to Philip, go over and join this chariot. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and asked, do you understand what you're reading? And he said, how can I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Now, the passage of the scripture that he was reading was this. Like a sheep, he was led to the slaughter, and like a lamb before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? 
for his life is taken away from the earth. And the eunuch said to Philip, about whom, I ask you, does the prophet say this, about himself or about someone else? Then Philip opened his mouth and beginning with this scripture, he told him the good news about Jesus. And as they were going along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What prevents me from being baptized? And he commanded the chariot to stop, and they both went down into the water, Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord carried Philip away, and the eunuch saw him no more, and went on his way rejoicing. When should I be baptized? Well, this man did not know about Jesus. God sent someone in to ask him, do you understand what you're reading? No, I don't understand. No one's explaining it to me. So he explains it. Philip starts with that scripture, explains who Jesus is, explains that this eunuch needs to be baptized. The eunuch says, well, there's water right there. Can I be baptized right now? And Philip said, yes. When can you be water baptized? When you make the confession of faith that Jesus Christ is the Lord of your life and you want to follow him all the days of your life and you repent from the sin that you have done and you decide to walk and follow Jesus Christ, then be baptized. Completely the way that scripture tells us to. It is a holy moment to be baptized. So, we remember that there is work to be done before, there's a holy moment during, and there is a life to live following holy water baptism. God, we thank you that you have told us that this is what we are to do. We are to be those that confess you as our God and our King. We are those that repent of sin. And then we are completely submerged as a washing away of an evil conscience and a burial of the old us. When we come out of the water, there is a freshness and a new life comes. And then as we walk out of the water, we begin a new, a brand new day, a new life. And then we learn and we follow what you've put in front of us. Thank you, God, for teaching us what it authentically means according to Holy Scripture to be baptized. You are a beautiful God who has always given us all the instruction that we need. As we close this time, we want to pray together in a way that we can pray together. So we stand before you, God, And we pray the prayer that you taught us to pray. And so we say together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, and thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. God bless you all until we meet again.